Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Peace and blessings be with you. Uh, we begin in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And uh, today we have a uh, very special guest and very special, uh, very special, special, sorry, session of Inside Islam, uh, specifically on Inside Ahmadiyya Islam. Um, so as you all know, uh, Inside Islam is a monthly intrafaith series that Muslim Space has created for the purpose of focusing on the diverse communities of beliefs and sects and movements and groups within Islam. When we say that Islam says this or Islam says that, oftentimes we do a disservice uh, because that may be very different in the experience and in the reality of not only what Islam is, but uh, what Islam has manifested for so many different people from uh, millions of individuals across the globe. And so these conversations, insh inshallah, will happen, and they do happen uh, in the form of uh, short, uh, informative kind of a lectures uh, by some respectable scholars and members of each respective community. So we want to make sure to, that we center the voices and perspectives from these different communities, uh, and then we'll have a short Q and A afterwards. Um, and so, inshallah, we'll be uh, recording the session. So if you're not able to attend for the full amount, or if you have to miss out on a little bit, no worries. Inshallah, we will uh, we will have it for you. But uh, just a real quick um, intro to. Uh, Imam Sagar Bajwa, um, and then we can go ahead and get started. But uh, Imam Bajwa is a missionary um, in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and he is uh, based in the Cayman Islands. Um, so he's got a very scenic view, uh, inshallah, for all his five salah. Uh, and he's originally from Canada. So um, he's from Vancouver. So he's got uh, uh, an even more you know scenic background as well coming up. But uh, Imam Sagar, uh, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to you, and I will get your slides projected up on the screen in just a sec. Perfect. Thank you so much, Osama. Um, I'll be starting off uh, with the recitation of the Holy Quran, and then I'll get straight into the presentation. Jazakumullah. Ashhadu ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان محمد نبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبي وكان الله بكل شيء عليم <تصفيق> of chapter 33 of the Holy Quran and its English rendering is as follows. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the ever merciful. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. And Allah has full knowledge of all things. <clears throat> With that very, uh, uh, for first thing I would like to say is uh, thank you to Muslim Space for the invitation. Um, you know, it's not every day that we hear about um, a Muslim platform so open to interfaith dialogue as you all can, um, I'm sure, sympathize or at least uh, I'm sure you all have a great understanding of that as well. Um, you know, faith is so dear to all of us, um, but when it comes to interfaith dialogue, um, it truly is, I believe, and, and the Ahmadiyya Muslim community specifically definitely believes that this is the key to bringing about religious harmony in the world. So thank you to Muslim Space for starting this wonderful initiative. And, um, and again, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. Um, 
So yeah, um, if I can ask you something, please, if you can switch on to the next slide. Um, just briefly today, uh, just briefly, I will be touching upon uh, these subjects um, after a brief introduction into our community, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, I will touch upon the system of caliphate or the system of khilafat that as within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, um, thereafter briefly touch upon the, the discrimination and the persecution that we face. And uh, then we'll go, we'll touch a little bit about um, our beliefs. And then I would like to touch upon two very important subjects, especially not only uh, specific to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, but overall, I would say uh, mainstream Sunni Islam. And uh, those topics are of uh, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and the seal of uh, prophets, the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa um, So next slide, please. <clears throat> Perfect, so the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, um, for many of you, uh, may, maybe you know, or maybe you don't, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is, uh, are Muslims who believe in uh, the Messiah, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, uh, peace be upon him. We believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was the second uh, metaphorical second advent of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and the Imam Mahdi, uh, peace be upon him. And the community was founded in 1889 in a small village, uh, Qadian, in Qadian, India, as a revival movement within Sunni Islam, uh, emphasizing uh, its essential teachings. And we believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, we refer to him as the promised Messiah. So if I go back and forth between Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and the promised Messiah, please make note that I'm speaking about Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who we in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community um, I believe was the promised Messiah, peace be upon him. We believe uh, that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he came to rid Islam of fanatical beliefs, uh, beliefs that became very rampant within uh, the, the Ummah, within uh, Islam, specifically Sunni Islam. Um, and with that said, he wrote over 80 books in which he in which he advocated for the true peaceful uh, message of Islam, true peaceful teachings of Islam, uh, the teachings of Islam, which, which, which show peace and which show patience and tolerance. Um, and we believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, we believe that he came and he fulfilled all of the prophecies which were laid out by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in regards to the second coming of Christ and the second coming of the Imam Mahdi. Now with that said, as I said that the community started off in a very small village of Qadian and it started off at a time with very humble beginnings. And I, I, what I wish to say uh, at this point is that you know, there was a time that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad himself, he writes throughout his writings that there was a time when no one knew of me. Yet I had a living relationship with my creator and it was at that time when no one knew of me, nor had I, had Allah told me to make any sort of claims or had, had sent me for any sort of grand, grand tasks at that time. However, Allah did vouchsafe many revelations to me. And one of those revelations was, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. And now by the grace of Allah, that same movement that started off in a small village of Punjab, India, is, has spanned over and is well established in over 200 countries of the world. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, upon the demise of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, he was succeeded by uh, the system of Khilafat or the system of Caliphate. And upon his demise, one after the other, the community has, uh, has been led by the five, five caliphs, five successors. And the current worldwide leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, his name is Mirza Masrur Ahmad, who resides in the United Kingdom. 
And we believe that, that this Khilafat was the same Khilafat in regards to which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also foretold in, in, in many of his traditions, in which he stated that centuries after him, Allah would again establish Khilafat on the precepts of prophethood. And so we believe that, uh, that to, the, the leadership within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a leadership appointed by Allah the Almighty. And um, currently, the, the caliph of the community is, is, uh, is, is working day in and day out, um, not in, within just the Muslim, Muslim world, but the world as a whole, and advocating for religious peace and religious tolerance. Now, under the system of Khilafat, I wish to, wish to point out that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has built over 16,000 mosques, 600 schools, and 30 hospitals across the globe. By the grace of Allah, through the system or through the leadership of Khilafat, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been able to translate the Holy Quran in, in, into over 70 languages as well. And the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, by the grace of Allah, is, is, uh, is teaching the, 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 the peaceful teachings of Islam through a 24-hour sat satellite television channel, namely MTA, Muslim Television Ahmadiyya. And it is also at the forefront of global uh, disaster relief through uh, a, a nonprofit organization, Humanity First. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, as many of you may know, um, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been has has been a victim of a very violent persecution uh, since the early 1900s. Since the time Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him made these claims and started the movement, started, started the community. Um, right from that, that time, the, the community has faced a lot of discrimination until it fin finally systemically climaxed in 1984 when the government of, ba of Pakistan actually declared Ahmadi Muslims to be non-Muslim by law. And so since that law was passed, for an Ahmadi Muslim to practice Islam or for any Islamic practice done by an Ahmadi Muslim is uh, punishable up to three years of imprisonment according to Pakistani law. Um, and of course, um, soon after this in 1984, the Caliph at the time, Mirza Tahir Ahmad, who at the time was a fourth Caliph of the community, he, he thought it was best that in order for the community to thrive, that it was best for the community headquarters to, to leave Pakistan. And it was at that time that the Caliph migrated to the United Kingdom. And since then, the community headquarters is located in the United Kingdom. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, um, Ahmadi Muslims specifically living in Pakistan, you know, they, they live in fear for their lives every day. Uh, and it's, it's extremely unfortunate, even in countries such as Algeria. And believe it or not, as of recent, even in Africa, uh, in, in Burkina Faso specifically, just at the beginning of this month on January 11th, nine of our Mus Ahmadi Muslim brothers were killed at gunpoint for not renouncing their faith. And so it's extremely unfortunate. And, you know, since, since these things have started, and since Pakistan declared us non-Muslim, you know, living in Pakistan for Ahmadis has become extremely difficult, right? Not from, not, and, and, you know, it's not even about just about being persecuted in, 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 in your workspace or in your schools, rather religious fanatics in, in, in Pakistan have called their followings, not just to kill Ahmadis, but as of recent even, they've gone to the extent of, you know, calling their followers to, to kill Ahmadi pregnant women. You know, the, this is the amount of discrimination and this is the amount of violence 
that Ahmadis are facing every day in Pakistan. <clears throat> Um, the, these these uh, photos that are on the slide here, um, I, I should mention that the one on the left uh, is a Darul Zikr Mosque uh, located in Lahore. And the reason I have posted this uh, or put this picture up on the screen is because in May of 2010, uh, some fanatics, extremists launched uh, one of the biggest attacks against our community uh, where at two of our mosques, on uh, a Friday prayer, over 90 Muslim Ahmadi, Ahmadi men were, were killed. And that marked the greatest attack against our community. Um, but it, I mean, it's, it's not just that, like I said, it's, it was, it's systemic dis discrimination that we're facing in Pakistan. As you can see in the picture on the right, that is a police officer erasing the very core of our religion, right? The Kalima Shahada um, off an Ahmadi mosque. And it's, it, it's something that we see every day. It's, it's rare that even a week passes that we don't hear about the killing of one of our own or about uh, uh, the a vandalism of Ahmadi mosques, even as if it's not enough to persecute the living, even our graves are desecrated. And in some rare cases, coffins have been set ablaze. So with that said, I mean, this is why um, I, I wish to, again, you know, thank Muslim Space for, for an invitation today is because not only are we facing discrimination, but it's, it's extremely rare for minorities to be given an opportunity or given a fair opportunity to, to, to speak about who they are and to, to dispel misconceptions. And so thank you again, Muslim Space, for the invitation today. Um, just recently, I should mention, uh, at, the, at the end of 2022, Amnesty International had, um, was planning a conference, or I shouldn't say planning, they, they, they did hold a conference in Pakistan for minority groups. And they wished to hear from uh, an Ahmadi representative as well, when all of a sudden, last moment, they received a phone call and they were told that if you want your, your conference to go through, then you have to drop the Ahmadi speaker. And so, this is, the, this is the amount of uh, hatred that we're facing in, in Pakistan. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now with that said, um, one misconception which I wish to uh, address uh, right from the, uh, the get-go is the origin of, of the community or the, specifically the origin of the name of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. You know, a lot of people, they, they, they sort of blow this out of proportion and they say, well, you know, you claim to be Muslims yet you've taken on an identity and you call yourself Ahmadis. And what uh, some religious uh, opponents, or I should say within Sunni Islam's, some opponents of, uh, of, of the community, they tell their following that they've named their community after Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Um, however, this isn't true. And the verse of the Holy Quran, which is on your screen, proves it. And it, it shows that Ahmad is actually the name of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, it's almost comical because this gets blown really out of proportion. And I, you know, when, when, I'm, when, I, when I speak to people, I, I tell them that, you know, if, if you take a look at the name of the, the founder of the community, his name was actually Ghulam Ahmad, which literally translates to servant of Ahmad. And Ahmad is none other, as I, as I just mentioned, is none other than the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and so this, this is, uh, one thing to make note of is that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is named after the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, as, as I just mentioned, um, we're often, especially in Pakistan, within Sunni Islam specifically, we are declared non-Muslim. And so I do wish to speak a little bit about this before I get into the more controversial subjects. Um, who is a Muslim, right? When we take a look at the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on many occasions, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained who a Muslim is. And this, there's, this is just one example that I've put on the screen where the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been recorded to have said, Man salla salatana, that whoever prays as we pray, 
wastaqbala qiblatana and turns to the same qibla as us wa akala zabihatana and eats from the same slaughtered meat as us same same slaughtered animals fazalik mul muslim that is a muslim you know it, it really is just as simple as that and and there are many more examples where we, we when we open up the ahadith one example that comes to mind is that uh, on one occasion the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed his companions and he said write down a list of a list of the people who have proclaimed to be muslim the the, the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were kullu man talaffaza bil islam that those people who with their tongue have claimed to be muslim who have uttered islam and so it really is just as simple as that that a muslim is he or she who simply says he or she is a muslim right and it, it's extremely unfortunate that even though um the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has made it so clear with his words that the ahmadiyya muslim community has been declared non muslim and you know this this actually reminds me of another example which i i do wish to share because this example is so clear that i i honestly believe that anyone who has even an iota of fear of god in their hearts they wouldn't argue against it and this is from a sahih hadith in which and it, it is related by usama bin zaid radhiyallahu anhu now usama was a very very uh he was very beloved beloved by the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was a son of zaid bin harsa he was a personal servant of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we all know how much what a loving relationship that was for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now usama says that during a battle i had cornered an enemy and i was i was standing over him ready to kill him and he said i was about i was going to about to kill him and when suddenly he said la ilaha illallah and usama still killed him when they reached back to medina and this news reached the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he immediately summoned usama and he said to usama that why did you kill him after he said la ilaha illallah and usama responded ya rasulullah he only said it out of fear again the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated but even after he said la ilaha illallah and the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam usama says went on to ask him over and over again repeatedly and usama says hatta tamannaitu anni lam akun aslamtu qabla zalik alyawm that he repeated it so many times to the point where till i felt that i i, I wished that i had not become a muslim till that day so this was how upset the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that usama even though that man said the kalima shahada that usama again went on and did not believe him and 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 still killed him and in another narration it is related that the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him Why did you not open why did you not cut open his heart to see whether he was telling the truth or not So I mean this is this is what it means to be a muslim right anybody who claims to be a muslim this no authority on the face of the earth can strip them of that identity of course unless they believe themselves to be a bigger authority or or a greater authority than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself <clears throat> Next slide please <clears throat> so firstly what I, what i would like to say is when it comes to mainstream sunni islam um ahmed eh, ahmadiyya islam is an off branch of sunni islam and so what i would like to say is that we believe in the in in the very core foundations of of sunni islam right we believe in the six articles of faith we believe in the five pillars of islam so why are we thought to be so different and why are we why are we persecuted in the name of islam right and the the only difference that i was able to come up with is the death of jesus alayhi salatu wassalam 
right? And apparently this is our crime. Ahmadi Muslims, the Ahmadi Muslim community believes that Isa wasalam, died a natural death just as all other prophets did. <clears throat> just as all other prophets did, sorry. Um, and so we don't just hold this belief uh, out of thin air, of course, right? We, we, we hold this belief um, on the basis of more than 30 verses of the Holy Quran. And unfortunately, um, and this is a subject that I will touch a little later on um, in, a, in a few minutes. Unfortunately, you know, some, some ulama, they try, to, they try and twist it and they try and tell their followers that don't believe them. They actually don't believe in the finality or in, this, in the seal of prophethood. They don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the last prophet. Uh, however, this is completely false, and I will come back to this. We do indeed believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Khatam al nabiyyin as I have recited the verse in, in, in the beginning of my presentation as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, one verse that uh, we base this belief about uh, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the one on your screen. And um, I know I'm pressed for time, so I'll just read the English translation where Allah says, and Muhammad is only a messenger, is only a messenger. Verily, all messengers have passed away before him. Right? All messengers have passed away before him. If then he die or be slain, will you turn back on your heels? Right, so Allah makes it very clear in this verse that just as Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger, just as he is a human, he will one day, a day will come when he will die. And then God goes on to say that Allah goes on to say, Qad khalat min rasul, that all messengers before him have also passed. Right? So next slide, please. Now the Ahmadiyya stance in regards to this is that whenever the word khala is used in past tense for humans, it always means death in the Holy Quran, not, not just in the Holy Quran. In fact, even if you open up the Ahadith or you open up Arabic lexicons, the word khala, whenever it is used for humans in past tense, the only way for a human to pass with this verb is death. And so that is the Ahmadiyya stance and that is supported by the Holy Quran as well. If you go to the next slide, please. These are just some examples on your screen of where the word khala has been used numerous times throughout the Holy Quran. These are just a few examples. There's many more. Entire generations, entire nations have been mentioned here with the same verb. And no one argues that, that you know, in, in these verses, that these generations have just merely passed, but they have not died. And so... Um, very clear from the Holy Quran that Isa alayhi um, just like all other prophets, uh, has passed away. Um, and with this said, of course, these, these are just some examples of the Quran, but I, I do wish to also uh, mention that even the companions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in fact, the very first consensus of the companions after the life, after the demise of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was upon this this fact that all messengers have died. Right in Kitab al-Tafsir, underneath this verse in Sahih al-Bukhari, it is related that upon the demise of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, of course the companions were struck with grief. To such an extent that it is related that Umar Raziallahu Anhu, Hazar Umar bin Khattab Raziallahu Anhu, he was so upset, he was so he was in so much uh, so much agony um, that he he actually took out his sword and he announced that anyone who tells me that the Prophet وسلم, has died, I will cut off his neck. And upon this, Abu Bakr Raziallahu Anhu, he sat down. Hazrat Umar radiyallahu anhu, and he recited this very verse, which which I have just quoted, that Ma Muhammadun illa Rasul, kad khalat min kabli Rasul. That Muhammad was only a man; he was only a messenger, and all messengers before him have passed away. 
And not one, not a single companion at the time stood up and said that, wait, well, hold on a second, right? Jesus والسلام, is still alive. And so, as I said, the Holy Quran is very clear about this. And we, we also find proofs of this in the ahadith and specifically with, with the consensus of the companions. And even if you go to the next slide, we take a look at some of the most renowned Arabic dictionaries. They also, as I said earlier, they also translate the word khala to mean death, right? Lisanul Arab, Akrabul Mawarid, and Tajul Uru, some of the most renowned Arabic lexicons. Each one of them state that khala, when it is used for a human, or when it's used for men or a person, it means mat, right? It means death. It's, a, it's, it's very clear cut. Go to the next slide, please. You know, from the Holy Quran, it is very clear that prophets are only men. And these are, these are two examples of many, many more. The, the first one, Allah makes it very clear. He states, and we sent none as messengers before thee, but men to whom we sent revelations. So ask the people of the reminder, if you know not, and look how clear Allah makes it. And in the next verse, Allah states, and we do not give them bodies that ate no food, nor were they to live forever. And in the next verse, Surah Al-Maidah, verse 76, Allah uses the same phrase for Isa والسلام, as he used for the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that, Mal ibn Maryam illa Rasul, that Jesus, peace be upon him, son of Mary, he was only a messenger. Qad khalat min rasul that all messengers before him have passed away. And what's even more, um, what's even more um, apparent from this verse is that Allah goes on to categorize Mary and Jesus in, in this, in, completely together. He says that well, Mary, his mother was truthful. She was a truthful woman. And they both used to eat. Categorizing them both together that they both used to eat and it's very clear that Hazrat Maryam والسلام, she does not eat no longer because she has died. She was a human, right? So just as she does not eat anymore, nor does Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. <clears throat> Next slide, please. One very unique belief of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is, um, of course, we just uh, touched upon uh, one aspect of it that Isa والسلام, died a natural death, but especially re in regards to the historical accounts of crucifixion. Um, as the Quran very clearly tells us that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. And we, we believe this. And the Quran also, as you can see, show, tells us that the, the Hazrat Isa والسلام, was a messenger sent to the children of Israel. Rasulan ila Bani Israel. Right? It's very, very clear in the Holy Quran, and we, we all understand this. However, when we look towards the Bible, we find a very, a very interesting uh, verse in, in, the, in the Gospel of John. Right? John 10, 16 is, is the exact reference where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is recorded to have said that I have other sheep that are not of this fold and they too must I bring. And they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Right? So when we, when we do a little bit more research and we take a look at uh, books of history and, we, and we, we open up the Jewish encyclopedia, it becomes very apparent that when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, being a Rasulan ila ben Israel, being a messenger that was commissioned to the to the Jews, right? It's very clear from the Quran that the Jews were divided into twelve tribes, and it is also a historical fact that from the age of when Jesus was born to the events of crucifixion, only two of the twelve tribes remained in 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 the country of Jesus in Palestine. The rest of them, 10 of the tribes had actually migrated or actually fled upon the, the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Salem. And it, it, it is very well known when, you, when we open up different books, uh, 
different books of history, specifically the Jewish Encyclopedia, and also um, um, different different books such as the Bukate Nasri, it, it very clearly tells us that these these ten tribes were scattered across Afghanistan, and even some had gone as far as to settle in northern India. And when we when we open up ancient Buddhist scriptures and his, historical scriptures of that time, we find that a man resembling Jesus made his way to India. And upon arriving there, upon arriving to Kashmir, he said that I am a prophet of God and I have been turned out by my people. I have been heavily persecuted by my people and I have fled my country. And so even when we, you know, when we take a look at the people of Kashmir, when we take, when, when, we, when we just analyze their, their facial, facial features, they look absolutely nothing like the, the rest of the people of the subcontinent. And people who are well-versed in, um, as in Kashmiri people that, that are well-versed their, with their heritage, they also claim to have Israelite ancestors. And so it is the Ahmadiyya belief that upon surviving crucifixion, Isa, Hazrat Isa migrated east. He traveled east in, in, in search of the 10 tribes who he was commissioned to as a prophet. Right? Well, Allah Ta'ala is very clear in the Holy Quran where he states, that is surely Allah and his messengers that prevailed. So it was the, it was the mission of, the, of Prophet Isa والسلام, to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so even uh, this verse of the Holy Quran that is before you, this also shows us that Allah gave refuge to Hazrat Isa and his mother. And it says, in an elevated land of, gre of green valleys and springs of running water. And this very clearly shows us, shows us an, an, an image of Northern India, right? Of Kashmir, India. And so that is one belief that is unique to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. We believe that Isa alayhi was salam um, migrated he, uh, he, upon surviving crucifixion, he traveled to India and he completed his task that he was that he was given by Allah. And we also find some narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One that says that Isa alayhi was salam lived to the ripe age of 120 years. And so it's very possible that Hazrat Isa alayhi was salam did indeed uh, live that long. Right? And this, this picture that's on the screen right here is, is showing us a shrine or the, the grave of that prophet that, that traveled from, uh, from the West and made his way to Northern India. And we believe that this is the grave of none other than uh, Hazrat Isa Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is just, uh, I know I'm pressed for time. This is the, this is the last, uh, last subject I'll be touching upon. And the reason I have decided to speak about this is because this by far, I would say, is the biggest misconception that is, um, that is falsely proclaimed by, I, I could say, our opponents, right? They, they, within Sunni Islam, um, some Muslim ulama, some Sunni scholars, they tell their followers that you know, Ahmadi Muslims do not believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was Khatam al that he was, he was not the seal of the prophets. However, let me make it very clear that Ahmadi Muslims believe in every verse of the Holy Quran. Right? Allah has made it very clear that the Holy Prophet وسلم, was Khatam al Nabiyin, and this is our belief. We do believe that he was the last law bearing messenger. Now, with that said, I must also mention that we do not believe that prophethood as a spiritual blessing has ceased to exist after the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We understand the word khatam al nabiyin we understand the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be khatam al nabiyin in all the meanings that he himself held, his companions held, and also according to the usage um, of, of the Arabs. 
right? And one example of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam using this very term is, is before you on the screen where he stated, Ana khatamul anbiyai wa anta ya ali khatamul awliya. That I am khatamul nabiyin, khatamul anbiya. I am the seal of the prophets. And O oh, Ali, you are khatamul awliya. You are the khatam. You are the seal of the saints. Right? And so it is our belief that just as there were, there were many saints that came after Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, we too believe that through the blessings, through the obedience of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if Allah wills, right, this is important, if Allah wills, that due to the spiritual blessings and the glory of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa this ummah has not been deprived of the spiritual rewards of prophethood. If Allah wills and there is a need for a prophet, there can be a prophet and Allah can surely bring about a prophet within the Muslim ummah. A person who is a, a, a completely obedient, perfectly subservient to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next hadith, or I should not call it a hadith, it is a narration of Hazrat Aisha Razillahu Anha, in which she heard some bystanders state saying that there is no prophet after the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon which she corrected them. Right, this is this is uh, this is this tradition is narrated in Durri Mansur, where she stated, "Kulu Nabiyin," that you should say that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is khatam al nabiyin, that he is the seal of the prophets. Walata kulu la nabi la nabi abadahu, but do not say that there is no prophet after him. So it's very clear from this narration as well that Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, to whom even modern scholars today claim that we have learned half our faith from Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha. You know, she spent so many years in close proximity of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that it's very clear from this narration that she too also held a belief contrary to how um, mainstream uh, Sunni Islam uh, takes the word khatam al nabiyin Right? So now with that said, with that brief explanation, I would just like to say that there are four meanings that we can make out of what Khatam al Nabiyin can mean. Right? Let me before before I go there, however, let me let me also explain the the usage of this of this term. You know, Arabs used to used to and still do to some extent within the Muslim Ummah. This this term has been widely used in literature. Right? Even to this day, if you go to the to, to shrines and graves of of, of saints, you will see this, this, the word khatam on their graves, right? For example, Mutanabbi was a very famous poet of his time. And he was, even to this day, he is recalled, and he, was, he, is, he is remembered as khatam al the seal of the prophet, a seal of the poets. Similarly, when he, even Buwa Lisina, he's very, very famously remembered as Khatamul Atiba, the seal of physicians. And so this, this term was used left and right, and it was specifically used to, to show the grandeur and to show, to, to, to use, use as a compliment that, that although there may be people of your expertise within your field or within your area, however, to us, you are the, you are, 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 are the last word. And this is what Khatam al Nabiyin means. We believe in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community that Khatam al Nabiyin means that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the greatest prophet. That no prophet can come after the Prophet وسلم, that does not bear the same deen as the Holy Prophet. No prophet can come after the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that can make any sort of abrogation to his, to his religion. Now, with that said, like I was saying, there are four main uh, meanings of khatam, which I will just briefly touch upon. And Ahmadi Muslims, we believe in all four of these, these meanings. The very first being a seal, the seal of the prophets, as in the ring uh, of uh, the ring of attestation, I should say. Um, khatam in the Arabic language also means a seal, a seal of attestation that is put 
um, that, that people use to, to on clay or in, or in older times, whenever you, in order to show something that was authentic, they, they would use a khatam, right? They, to, to show a seal of attestation that this is an authentic uh, document or so on and so forth. And so with this meaning in mind, we do believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was khatam in the beginning, that he, that no past prophet nor future prophet can be regarded truthful unless they bear the seal of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is, this is just, this is the first meaning that, uh, that we, that we believe that any prophet that, that is to come after the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will surely be a subservient prophet and will be completely obedient to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the teachings he brought and to the, to the Holy Quran. The second meaning of Khatam is that, and, and as I just showed from uh, the, the, the usage from, from Arabs, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best. He was the, he was the noblest and he was, a, he was the most perfect of all the prophets that he was also the source of embellishment for previous prophets, right? If we, th take, a, if we take a look at the Holy Quran, this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the one unique thing about the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out of all the prophets. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the only prophet who bared testimony to the truthfulness of previous prophets. And so this was a, this was a, a great, you could say, blessing or, or um, I should say, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, that, that all other prophets will surely be eternally grateful to the Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he came and through the Holy Quran showed that all prophets were truthful, whether it was, whether it was Abraham, whether it was Moses, whether it was Jesus, right? There's, there's no there's no proof to their truthfulness after their own scriptures, but the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the Holy Quran, through the Holy Quran, showed the truthfulness of the previous prophets. The third meaning of Khatam that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community also believes is that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was the last law-bearing prophet. And this interpretation has not only been um, as in, it's, it's not nothing new that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has, uh, has, has made up out of thin air. However, this, this, this meaning of Khatam and Nabiyin has been accepted by many eminent Muslim scholars, and to name a few, Ibn Arabi, right? People to this day remember Ibn Arabi as Sheikh Akbar, Shah Waliullah Delvi, right? So many eminent uh, scholars within Islam have also written about uh, this meaning of, of Khatam and Nabiyin, that no prophet can now come that can, that can abrogate the deen of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That any prophet that is to come in the future, if Allah wills, will surely be subservient to the Prophet Muhammad. And the last meaning of Khatam and Nabiyin is that he is the last of the prophets, but only in the sense that all the qualities and attributes of prophethood found their most perfect and complete consummation and expression in him, right? We do not believe that he was the last in time because, you know, if you think about it, there is no glory in, in being the last when it comes to time. However, he was indeed the last in word. He was, he was the last in teachings. And this, these are the meanings that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community hold. And this is exactly, in summary, let me just say that this is what we believe about Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him as well, is that, and in fact, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad himself, throughout his writings, he says that I would not have achieved any of these spiritual blessings from my Lord if I had not followed the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This verse, let me just uh, quickly read it out. This is one verse that very clearly shows that from the Holy Quran that prophethood is a spiritual reward that Allah blesses those who are deserving of it. 
And Allah says in the Holy Quran, الرسول, that those that whoever obeys Allah, whoso obeys Allah, what Rasul and this messenger, right? If, if anyone here is, you know, if, if you're well aware of Arabic grammar, when the alif lam comes at the, be, at the beginning of a noun, it becomes very specific. And ar Rasul, wherever it is used in the Holy Quran, it refers to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whoever follows this Prophet, فَأُولَائِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ That whoever follows this messenger shall be among those upon whom Allah has bestowed his blessings, namely the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous. And, and excellent companions are these. وَحَسُنَ أُولَائِكَ رَفِيكَ And so this is what from this verse, we can very clearly see that prophethood is a spiritual reward. And the Ahmadiyya Muslim community's understanding is that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, being the greatest of the prophets, he did not come and strip the greatest, the greatest ummah, the greatest nation of spiritual rewards. This is a, this is a belief that uh, we, are not will, we are not willing to accept. Because where the Holy Quran very clearly states Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas, that the Muslim ummah is the greatest, that is, is the greatest and has been risen for the, for, the, for the guidance of mankind, for the goodness of mankind. And previous dispensations such as the Mosaic dispensation, they had so many prophets. They had so many messengers. They were, they were, they were blessed with these rewards if, when Allah willed, when there was a need for a prophet. So how is it that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam can come and strip the, an entire ummah of such beautiful spiritual rewards? In the end, I will close on the next slide with two quotes of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him himself. He states, the gist of our faith is la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Our belief, which we hold in this life here on earth, and to which we will continue to adhere firmly till the time that we pass on to the next world, is that our spiritual leader and master, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is Khatam al nabiyyin the seal of the prophets, and the best of the messengers. At his hands, religion has consummated, has been consummated, which guide man onto the right path and further onto God himself. And in another, in another book, he, he states, it would not have been possible for me to have attained this grace if I had not followed the footsteps of my Lord and master, the pride of all prophets, the best of mankind, Muhammad, the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever I have achieved by following him, and I know from my truly verified experience that no man can reach God to obtain a deeper understanding of his ways without following this prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Ameen, jazakumullah. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. If there are any questions in regards to, um, to the presentation or overall any questions in regards to uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, um, I, I welcome it, please. Thank you. All right, Jazakallah khair, Imam Sagabajwa. We appreciate uh, the detail and the depth in which you went um, to be able to uh, give such a rich kind of context and background across not just the the theology, not just kind of the the aqida, but also the the real world implications as well. Um, as as you know, you you cited just under two weeks ago, you know, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community experienced um, a, a very brutal and very inhumane uh, attack uh, and nine worshipers in, in Burkina Faso, uh, I believe they're in a mosque, you know, praying in, in, in a house of Allah of all places, uh, uh, separated from their women and their children, uh, massacred right there. Um, to, that this isn't anything of a, of a kind of abstract, this is very real. And, you know, 2023 is a half a month, one month in. And so I appreciate you lifting that up with some details. We definitely do have some questions that uh, did come in. So uh, inshallah, we'll 
uh, jump into that. And as I mentioned, um, for the sake of time, if y'all would like, y'all can still put the ch uh, questions in the chat or message them to me. But uh, we've had quite a few that have come in, so inshallah, it probably will take us to what we've got. But we will put uh, uh, Imam Sagar's uh, email to for further questions and whatnot that you might have at another time into the chat as well, so you can continue that conversation. But inshallah, to go ahead and start off, uh, the first question we had was with respect to Khilafat or the Caliphate, um, you had mentioned that the Khalifa gets appointed by Allah. Um, how is this? How does this process happen? Is it through Wahi? Uh, can you say a little bit more about the process of uh, selection or election of the Caliph uh, within Ahmad Islam? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the for, for, for the question. Um, I should have touched upon that. Um, well, our, it's our belief that the, the system that is put in, in place is no different than the system that was put in place after the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? The leaders of the community came together and under their divine, under their wisdom, um, they came together and, and they used to decide who was, who, who was the rightful heir to follow the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the previous Caliph. However, our community, uh, with that being said, our community has in, in, in place a system which we refer to as the electoral college. And basically what this is, is after a, a, a Caliph passes away, he, before his demise and from at, with time to time while he is in office and while he is carrying out his tasks as a Khalifa, he, he makes changes that we believe under uh, definitely divine revelation, absolutely. He makes changes to the list of the, of the members of the community who will come together upon his demise to, to elect the next Khalifa. And so um, in, in summary, it is, an, it is a system of an election. Um, I, it, but as I said, it's, it's our belief that Allah truly does put it in the heart of, of those members who, who are given such, such a grand task appointed by the previous caliph that Allah definitely does put it in their heart uh, to, as to who the next caliph uh, uh, Allah wills to be. Exactly. It sounds like there's like kind of a parallel between uh, how the Pope is kind of elected in a sense, or at least like the, the council kind of comes and, you know, deliberates in, in a manner of speaking and, you know, chooses in that sense uh, right. after a series that. Okay, exactly for that. Um, the uh, next question we have is that um, how can the ordinary, how can an ordinary person from other Islamic uh, traditions or communities uh, be uh, a good ally to Ahmadis or the Ahmadiyya community in general? Right, that's that's a that's that's a great question, um, and I would say that I mean the greatest thing that uh, we can do is uh, is you know within our own within our own social circles within our own um, within our own you know uh, scopes to try and give voice to what is happening with the Ahmadi Muslim community. You know, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, peace be upon him, he came and he and 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 we believe that. He, you know, he penned over 80 books and we, we are surely going through a time in, in, in this modern era where writing is one wonderful way um, to, to speak the truth, right? So just, to, to just you know, caught, uh, making, making the world aware as to what is happening, um, you know, that, that would be greatly appreciated um, for one to, of course, you know, educate yourselves as well as to and keep up with what is happening specifically in Pakistan right and doing what we can within our limited scopes to give aware give uh, you know give give a rise to awareness uh, about, about this Thank you, Imam Sagar. And also, uh, I think that follows into the next question um, that, that picks up on that in a sense of uh, in, in how to learn a little bit more. Um, the question comes that, uh, do you have a book rep uh, recommendation uh, if one wants to explore uh, the Ahmadiyya uh, tradition a little bit more, wants to learn a little bit more, any, any books or resource recommendations you might have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it really does depend on what subject um, 
uh, you're interested in. Um, if it's specifically in regards to some of the topics that I discussed today, specifically in regards to Jesus and his uh, and his migration to India, there's a there's a beautiful book that has been written by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed titled Jesus in India. Um, furthermore, um, one one beautiful book that uh, I can recommend is is uh, the philosophy of the teachings of Islam. Um, uh, other than that, I mean, uh, as I said, he's, he's written over 80 books and uh, you can have access to all of them um, on our website, which is alislam.org. That's www.alislam.org. And you can uh, go through the library there and uh, there, there's, a, there's a very, there's a wide variety of uh, books you can choose from. Zakla, I appreciate that. Um, and we'll, 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 put, we'll drop those links into the chat as well for folks to have. Um, a, a question we have here uh, that comes is, uh, could you touch a little bit upon, um, you mentioned that uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was the uh, Imam Mahdi and the metaphorical second coming of Isa um, in, uh, in, in in uh, Islamic uh, tradition, generally it's understood the or interpreted that the Imam Mahdi would be a separate figure and Isa al Islam separate uh, towards the end of times. Um, how do Ahmadis reconcile this difference um, from some of the Rawayat or the traditions that uh, that give rise to this interpretation? Right. Um, what we focus on is uh, uh, one specifically, let me say, a narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. Very clear. Um, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been reported to have said that. Uh, that there is no Mahdi except Isa. And so that is one, um, one narration that, uh, we, that, we, that we, um, we look towards. And that is, um, is under the basis of that, um, that hadith as well, did the, the promised Messiah, Mirza Wullah Muhammad, peace be upon him, say that there is no Mahdi except Isa. Um, furthermore, um, you know, when it comes to such things, right? You need to you need to judge a person by 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 his character, by his writings, and by the claims he's made. And when we open up the Holy Quran to do a firm study, to do a thorough study of what who do the truthful people of Allah look like, right? What what are some of the conditions that they must meet um, in light of the Holy Quran, and then. Um, at the end of the day, if a certain person meets the, those criteria, well, then there's there's no reason to not take what he is saying to be the truth. If he is passing, if he's, you know, if if Allah Taala has given us a rubric as to you know what truthful men of God do such and such things, they 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 have they have pure characters, they have, you know, false claimants of prophethood false false claimants to be prophets Allah does not let them live Allah severs their jugular vein this is what Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran and so there are many verses of the Holy Quran which by which we can sort of measure a, a, a claimant and so I invite all my brothers and sisters who are listening today to 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 measure the the Mirza Ghulam Ahmad according to the, that rubric that Allah Ta'ala has laid out in the Holy Quran. <clears throat> Definitely, Jazakla. And, and, and the last question we have here, I think, built off of uh, what you, with, you know, the, the space that you were kind of lifting up in that sense, that um, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community sounds like, and it looks like that despite being a persecuted minority, heavily persecuted, and even, uh, you know, illegalized in some countries such as Pakistan, still is not deterred from propagating the message or propagating um, uh, Ahmadiyya Islam in around the world or in different places. And so uh, the question comes then uh, for anybody here, whether they are you know based in central Texas or whether they're tuning in from any part of the world or whatnot, um, if they want to connect with a local Ahmadi mosque or a community that is maybe nearby or within their locality, um, what's the best way for them to do so, uh, and yeah, any advice you can give to connecting to people uh, of uh, the Ahmadiyya community? You no, know, I mean, uh, for, for, 
I mean, first, uh, firstly, I would say, you know, just just Google it, see if there's there's a if there's an established community uh, within your vicinity. Um, if not, then of course, um, as as Osama has mentioned as well, uh, my contact information will also be shared. If you ever wish to reach out to to a missionary, or if you wish out wish wish to reach out to a community nearby, then you can reach out to me, or you can you can even go online, as I said, and uh, it's it. I mean, it's it's all out there. We're, we're not we're not hiding. We're out we're out here, and uh, we're we're trying our very best to um, to to con to continue um, spreading uh, the tr the true peaceful teachings of Islam. And so, um, yeah, like I said, you can definitely reach out to me as well. And uh, if not, then uh, definitely you'll be able to find your the locus uh, the or the closest Ahmadiyya Muslim community uh, in your area online. Absolutely. So, and uh, for everyone who's here, anybody who's uh, uh, who will be watching, inshallah, in the future, and for anybody who you shared this with, um, we will definitely be providing this information as well. So the conversation can always continue. It doesn't have to be limited to this space, but uh, we extend our heartfelt uh, gratitude. Again, I'm Sagra for being able to join us uh, from a time Thank zone you. ahead of us uh, and okay. for being able to put together such a detailed yet such an insightful presentation on one of, if not the most uh, misunderstood communities uh, and faith uh, communities of belief within Islam, uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So uh, we're indebted to you, inshallah. Uh, yes, we so. wish you nothing but the best. And for all of you who are attending here, just know that um, our religion is is one based on action. We've heard uh, we've heard something, we've, we've uh, learned something, and now uh, we're going to be tested with what do we do with that. Um, and as uh, Imam Sagar had uh, had uh, has uh, echoed and had lifted up what can we do to be better allies what can uh, you all do to be better allies apart from being informed yourself um, helping to kind of communicate and and dispel some of those misconceptions that are surrounding us in so many different ways so inshallah we'll keep the work going but uh, Imam Sagar again Jazakallah from Muslim Space and from everybody here we appreciate right. it Pre appreciate the invitation thank you so much Absolutely. Well, inshallah, next next uh, our next session of uh, Inside Islam uh, will be uh, in February. Uh, we'll be uh, talking about the Bohri Muslim community, uh, the Bohri Shia community. And so stay tuned. Uh, you can subscribe to uh, Muslim Spaces newsletter or you can just contact us offline to stay connected and we'll send you an update. But that next session will happen then and we'll be continuing through uh, Ramadan, inshallah. But I hope you all have a blessed night um, and a, a good night and we will be talking to you all soon. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.